Thank you for watching the Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable Waste Ban presentation. My name is Sherry and I am the coordinator for the Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable. We are an organization made up of many different groups that work together to keep the Coquitlam River watershed healthy. A watershed is an area of land where water drains to one place. In the Coquitlam River watershed, all water drains into the Coquitlam River. The Coquitlam River drains into the Fraser River, and the Fraser River drains into the Pacific Ocean. Today, we'll talk about litter in the Coquitlam River watershed, but litter is a problem in all our watersheds in this area. When we talk about waste, we often use the words waste, litter, or garbage. These words all usually mean the same thing, but when you think about garbage or waste, think about materials that are no longer wanted. When you think about litter, think about loose garbage that is often found on the ground outside of garbage bins or containers. Today, we'll talk about why litter is a problem, where we see it, what we find, and how you can help. So, what is the problem? Litter is harmful to animals on land and sea. It can cause slow and painful deaths if animals become entangled, so litter gets wrapped around their body, if they suffocate when plastic or other litter prevents them from breathing, or if they eat poison or sharp objects. Masks are a special concern. Many animals are becoming entangled in the ear loops. Please remember to cut the strings when you dispose of your mask, or better yet, choose a cloth mask and attach it to your clothing so you don't lose it. There is 60 times as much plastic in the ocean as there are plankton, which are the very small animals that feed many larger marine mammals. Plankton are so small, they represent the beginning of the food chain. Broken down plastic can end up so small it looks like plankton, so marine mammals eat it. That means that anything that eats those larger mammals, including humans, are also ingesting bits of plastic. Over long periods of time, plastic breaks down and can release toxins into the air, water, and earth, which is bad for both human and animal health. Cleaning up litter can cost lots of money. We need garbage pickers, bags, clipboards, gloves, and personnel. Litter cleanups can be hazardous or dangerous because the people cleaning up can find things like needles, they can get into traffic accidents, or they can be exposed to toxins. Which river would you prefer? The garbage river on the left or the clean river on the right? We're willing to bet it's the clean river on the right. So where do we find litter? We often find it on nature trails and shorelines, on parks and school fields, beside streams, at forest edges near roads, in and around storm drains, at bus stops, and on roadways. Let's return to storm drains for a minute. Do you know where storm drains lead? It's a common misconception that storm water is treated before release, but in fact, these drains lead directly to the nearest creek or stream. That means that anything that goes in it goes into our local waterways. This is a map of the most common places we find litter in the watershed. The red dots indicate a litter hotspot. The green space down the middle of the map where you see all the red dots, that's the Coquitlam River. We often find litter along the trails near parking areas, at summer beaches, and in homeless camps. I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa, our engagement coordinator, who will discuss a bit about what we find and how you can help. Thank you, Sherry. 
So what do we find when we go out and collect litter? Every year, there's a big event called the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Anyone can participate and volunteers get into groups and teams to pick up litter from shorelines, rivers, uh, lakesides, and their favorite parks. And so this is what they found back in 2019. Cigarette butts made up the most amount of litter at 42%, which is actually consistent with what is found worldwide. So even though cigarettes are really small items, they continue to make up the most amount of litter across the globe, both by volume and by weight. The second most popular type of litter are tiny pieces of plastic and foam. And the plastic, as we've seen, breaks down easily um, due to mechanical impact, also through weathering by water, by waves, by wind. So we can see how these tiny pieces of plastic can easily enter the food chain and harm animals. We also see food wrappers and bottle caps along with paper scraps and plastic bags, aluminum beverage cans, which are actually a really good material to recycle, as well as plastic bottles and straws, different types of packaging, pieces of foam, which include styrofoam, and of course, our single-use, non-recyclable coffee cups. So when we look locally, at the cities of Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam, for example, we see very similar types of litter that were collected across the country. So once again, cigarette butts make up the largest amount of litter. And the reason why they don't disappear is because there's actually fiberglass inside cigarettes. So they really never decompose. Again, we see pieces of plastic and foam as the second highest kind of litter followed by food wrappers, and then all the other types of litter that we saw in the national findings as well. Watch for the small stuff. Items made from plastic can be easily broken, and when they fall to the ground as litter, they can find their way into storm drains, either blown by wind or washed along by rain. As we learned earlier, storm drains connect directly to the nearest waterway and eventually to the oceans. This is how some of our plastic litter finds its way into our oceans. So what can we do? Purchasing items made from durable materials such as wood or metal will mean the toy, for example, can last for years, even generations. And if accidentally damaged, wood and metal can be repaired, unlike their plastic equivalents. So how else can we avoid excess plastic in our lives? As you can see from these photographs, they all have to do with food. In the first one, we've got a food container, which we see in restaurants for takeout um, or perhaps at your grocery store in the deli department. But pre-COVID, it would be surprising though to see how many of these places will actually let you use your own clean, reusable and food safe container made from either glass or stainless steel, enamel, and later we'll find out a bit about silicone. When it comes to drinks, we're quite familiar with the single-use but non-recyclable coffee cups. A far better way to enjoy your hot beverage is actually with your own insulated travel mug, either made of stainless steel or again a ceramic, something that is durable and ideally non-breakable, actually makes the drink more enjoyable, helping it to keep either hot or cold. And when it comes to shopping for our food, I think most of us are familiar with plastic shopping bags but more and more of us are bringing our own shopping bags, either made of cotton, a type of cloth, or in this case, jute, a very strong canvas material that actually allows you to carry even heavier items 
more comfortably than plastic. And then when it comes to the smaller items, your fruits and vegetables, there of course are those smaller plastic produce bags. You can reuse those plastic bags over and over again, but a better idea is again to use either little cotton bags, um, or if you're only buying one or two apples at a time, you actually don't even have to wrap them. They can just go naked. What else could we do to avoid excess plastic in our lives? Well, fortunately, some companies are starting to make toothbrushes out of sustainable bamboo, for example. And as we continue to go through this COVID-19 pandemic together, many people are getting very creative with those face masks. In this photograph, it's a great example of repurposing old clothing, old fabric, into just that, face masks. And can you imagine if each one of us carried around our own picnic set so that every time we ate food outside the home, we were simply using uh, food safe, reusable materials? So this kit here shows uh, utensils made of bamboo, a stainless steel straw, a durable drinking cup, insulated bottle, and a cloth napkin. When you do your grocery shopping, it's interesting to note that in a typical grocery store, it's the center aisles that contain all that over packaging, whether it's plastic wrap or cardboard. It's the outside edges where your naked fruit and vegetables are that's the best way to avoid over packaged goods. And of course, using your own cloth bags in the process. Don't forget to check out the bulk food section of your grocery stores as that's a great way to stock up on baking goods like flour and sugar, your cereals, and those favorite snacks, again, without excess packaging. And once you've enjoyed those fruits and vegetables, please consider composting them. Composting is taking all these organic materials and subjecting them to high heat for enough time to allow soil microbes to break the organics down and back into soil. Just remember before doing so to remove any of those stickers, rubber bands, or metal twist ties before putting any items in the green bin. So what other tips could we adopt to avoid excess plastic in our lives? We mentioned silicone before. Silicone is a wonderful food safe material and it's also heat resistant. So you can store both cold and hot food items in these storage bags. The middle photo is a great example of repurposing old clothing, in this case, a sock. So by tying up one end of the sock and filling it with rice and or beans, and perhaps adding some wonderful smelling lavender oil, you can create your very own heating pad that can be heated up in the microwave. And the last photograph on the right is a picture of Nada, a fairly new grocery store in Vancouver that was founded by a young marine biologist who was so concerned about the growing amount of plastic in our oceans that she wanted to give shoppers a real choice to be able to buy food without excess packaging or plastic. So I encourage you to check out Nada. Many of you have probably heard of recycling, and years ago, we thought that recycling would help reduce the amount of garbage we produce. Sadly, this is not the case. Firstly, not many materials end up properly recycled. In fact, less than 10% of plastics are actually recycled. This partially explains why 80% of the litter now found in the oceans is made of plastics. Secondly, recycling takes a lot of energy fossil fuel energy, so it should never be our first choice. Our first choice should be to refuse plastics and single-use items as much as possible, then to reduce their use at source, followed by reusing items such as plastic bags as many times as possible, or repurposing an item as was previously shown with that single sock. Last on the list should be looking to recycle those materials that can actually be recycled. Sadly, just because there's a recycle symbol on the package doesn't mean that the appropriate recycling facilities actually exist. When it comes to organics, 
are food and garden materials, composting on-site in your yard or using the city's green bin system is great. Allowing these organics to rot means to compost. For those of you with furry companions, believe it or not, the best way to deal with dog waste is to bring it home and carefully empty just its contents down the toilet while disposing of the used plastic bag in the garbage. Metro Vancouver's sewerage system is designed specifically to handle the three P's, that is pee, poo, and toilet paper. Lastly, to make a difference, you could join a community cleanup vent, similar to one of the ones the Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable hosted this past Earth Week. But you don't have to wait for an event to be organized. You could get a few friends together and help keep your favorite park or trail clean from litter. When I walk the dog, for example, I try to bring a spare plastic bag with me so that I can pick up a few litter pieces along the way. The middle photograph shows us just how much soft plastic ends up covering our food, including our dog food, and those chip bags and beverage containers, rice, beans, uh, even your tea, that cardboard box is covered in plastic overwrap. And sadly, our municipal blue box recycling system is not equipped to handle soft plastics or other specialty items like old batteries, light bulbs, and styrofoam. These items need to be taken to a return it depot for proper recycling. But thanks to London Drugs, they have also started to put small recycling centers in many of their stores, so you can take these specialty items to London Drugs if that's where you frequently shop. So this map of the Lower Mainland shows just how many return it depots exist for us to use. And if you visit the link below, you can get the exact address for those locations that are most convenient for you. If you don't drive or have a car, Perhaps you can team up with a friend, a neighbor, or a colleague at work. And in that way, you can encourage other people to get involved in making sure these soft plastics and styrofoam and specialty items are recycled properly. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've learned some useful, helpful tips and tricks. And if you'd like to find out more about the Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable or to join one of our community events, please visit our website at coquitlamriverwatershed.ca or feel free to contact Sherry, our Roundtable Coordinator, directly at coordinator at coquitlamriverwatershed.ca. But before you go, please tell us what you learned. By visiting the link below, it will take you to a short survey and we would greatly appreciate your participation in that. Thanks again for listening, and please stay well.